Welcome to Retroality TV Presents Reimagine That with Chris Mann, offering refreshing reality with a retro twist. This week, we have part two of Chris's exclusive interview with Emmy-winning Young and the Restless actress-turned-author Beth Maitland. Then, join us for another insightful reawakening segment with our resident dreamweaver, Yvonne Reba. And now, introducing your host, Chris Mann. Thank you so much, Linda Kay, our vintage-voiced announcer and producer. And hi there, everyone. Welcome to episode 22 of Reimagine That, the Retroality.tv podcast, where Retropop meets Forward Thought. It's a little intersection there, and that is where we are. We have a fun show today. We have part two of our exclusive, in-depth, insightful interview. Very thoughtful, enlightening comments from Beth Maitland, who plays Tracy Abbott Connolly on The Young and the Restless, three decades plus strong. You won't want to miss the conclusion of her interview, where she talks openly for the first time ever about Brenda Dixon, her co-star in the 80s, the original Jill. Brenda has a new book out, more on that in a bit. Also, Beth talks and shares some never-before-heard loving stories about the late Jeannie Cooper, whose funeral as Catherine Chancellor will be happening on September 3rd and 4th on The Young and the Restless on CBS. Boy, oh boy, is that going to be a sad one. But take heed, if you are in the L.A. area and you want a respite in between those two episodes of The Young and the Restless, then honor Jeannie Cooper's spirit and be young at heart but oh so not restless, and go see Carly Ritter. John Ritter and Nancy Ritter's daughter is releasing her debut album. It just came out, self-titled Carly Ritter. She is a folksy, country, soulful blend. Quite an interesting, unique voice that this young lady has. On September 3rd, she has a record release show at Hotel Cafe, 1623 North Coanga Boulevard in Los Angeles. Check her out at facebook.com backslash Carly Ritter Music. Also, youtube.com backslash Carly Ritter Music. And her website is carlyritter.verb.com. And whether you are in the L.A. area or not, you've got to support this emerging artist who is also the granddaughter of country singing cowboy actor legend Tex Ritter. Support her by buying her CD. It's available on iTunes. It's available on Amazon. Again, the title is Carly Ritter. We're going to be hearing a lot from this young woman over the next several months and years. It's an exciting time for her. Show your support. All three of John and Nancy's kids are doing well and rolling out different forms of creative expression. Carly is musically gifted. As we all know, John and Nancy's eldest son, Jason, is a successful actor. He was in the event. He has been in Parenthood. He's been in movies. So many things. Uh, He has a new series coming up on Fox in 2014 called Us and Them. The uh, network has placed a 13-episode order for this uh, single-camera comedy, and he just started filming it. I think this is going to be a big hit for him. And finally, their son, Tyler. He is also an actor, and he is opening next Friday, September 6th, at the Malibu Playhouse in his first play, titled The Dream of the Burning Boy. Tyler was seen last year, I believe it was, in a comic Old Navy commercial kind of reminded me of John, those comic stylings, but each of these three uh, young adults have their own form of artistry, and they've got it in their genes from their mom and their dad both, their grandfather, but they also are their own people and are doing some really exciting, creative, inspired things. So be on the lookout for all three of these Ritter kids. And speaking of my lucky number three, Three's Company, how can I do a podcast or really hold any conversation without mentioning Three's Company? Uh, September, we will have some coverage. September is a special month. It will mark the uh, 10th anniversary of the passing of John. So hard to believe. But his spirit lives on in his family, as well as in his huge body of work. September is also a special month for fans of Three's Company. It was when the last episode aired, and what will be 29 years ago, September 18th. 
I'm excited because I have a new edition of my Threes Company behind the scenes tell-all book in the works for next year. So come and knock on our door next month. We'll be waiting for you and we'll chat up a friend of mine who is a Threes Company aficionado and a real great guy, a media expert. His name is Andy Herman. He is a radio producer. He now works in television. You won't want to miss that. It'll be great fun. Speaking of tell-alls, and I've mentioned this on a previous show or two, Brenda Dixon, the original Jill on Young and the Restless, has a new memoir out, My True Hidden Hollywood Story, her story of blacklisting, sexual harassment, and so on. And it's really an explosive, controversial book. I bring it up here again because Beth Maitland, again, candidly goes on the record for the first time, not only about this book, which says some really unflattering things about uh, the late Jeannie Cooper and late YNR creator William Bell, but also Beth talks for the first time about what it was like to work with Brenda, so you will not want to miss that part of her interview. Uh, I wasn't there behind the scenes at Three's Company, but I feel like I can speak to the book itself, having written a behind-the-scenes tell-all about a show where there were very different realities between a star and her producers. And in some cases, the cast members, Suzanne Summers, wrote her own book after the fall. She gave me an in-depth interview for the Three's Company book, as did John and Joyce DeWitt, and virtually the rest of the cast and crew of that show. There are three sides to every story, but this is Brenda's story. But many people might feel that her take on things is unfair, particularly given the fact that neither Jeannie nor Bill Bell is here to give their sides of the story in response. So I will leave that up, as I did with my book, to the readers to decide. But I just have to say that I read Jeannie Cooper's book, cover to cover. She said some lovely things about Brenda, and I think it's very, very sad that Brenda has not returned those sentiments. And Brenda is rolling out her book. She's doing radio interviews. She's doing internet interviews. And it's sad because this should be a time of celebration for the memory of Jeannie Cooper. I would love to hear Brenda say some nice things, some heartwarming things, even if she has other things to say. Let's hear it all. But we hear it all from the lovely Emmy-winning Beth Maitland. And now let's roll into part two of her breathtakingly um, candid, refreshing interview. And we are refreshing reality here at Reimagine That. Beth is the perfect guest for us. You know her as Tracy Abbott Connolly, but she has so many other facets. She talks here about working behind the scenes for the last 15 or so years on sitcoms. Did you know that? She also has a new ebook, Bewitching Fresh Stitching, that will be out very soon, as well as a print book. BethMaitland.com has all the info, all of her social media links. She also appears online on YouTube in a very saucy role in a new online soap called The Grove. Uh, Ask her about that. We cover so much fun, interesting terrain about her creative rebirth, her combining the creative with the technical. This gal has it all going on, and I'm so pleased to have her here. And we are all keeping our fingers crossed that she stays permanently in Genoa City on The Young and the Restless. You guys, let it be known. Tweet the producers. Tweet CBS. Tweet Sony. Tweet, tweet, tweet all day long. But don't twerk. Let them know we want Beth back on our daytime TV screens for good. Clearly, YNR has been a wellspring of goodness for you. You had mentioned your husband working as an Emmy winning sound mixer. You have also worked behind the scenes on some sitcoms yeah. and you interact with the director. What is your capacity there and how is well, that a, going? Um, I, I have actually been doing it surprisingly. I just found out I'm in my 16th year. Wow. <laughs> doing my little day job. Uh-huh. My job is called a recordist. 
I'm sort of the intermediary between what we shoot while it's going on in front of the audience and in pre-shoot days, the actual production sound and notes and camera. I keep notes that are time code notes that help the editor put the show together once it gets into post-production. Okay. And I run some little machines. That's the face of, of how they record and shoot the television and sound have changed a lot over time. So I just sort of learned, and I, I like technology, so that's, that's the easy part. Mm -hmm. um, and, but primarily, I'm clerical. And so I took the job the first time because um, my daughter was small and I wasn't working much at The Young and the Restless. And I really thought I might like to direct. Mm -hmm. And what I knew I had, my strong point was, is certainly character analysis, dealing with the actors, blocking and all of that. But what mm. I felt was my weak point was trying to send to post-production everything they would need technically, like get all the proper camera shots and have enough coverage of things. I was insecure about that area. Mm -hmm. So I took this job to, to sort of on the job training wow. because I sit next to the person who actually switches the show for the audience and brings up the right close up and master shot, wide shot and inserts they, that person sits next to me and actually brings up what the audience needs to see to be watching it like it's a real TV show. And then all of my notes, I keep track of when we start, when we stop in time code, all of my notes go with all the film and, and audio to post-production and the editors look at my notes to make that all sync, to make it all work together. And okay. so um, sitting next to that person cutting shots taught me a great deal over the years. And also, just even as an acting class, I've watched the best comedic actors and yeah. the not so proficient ones. <laughs> and I've seen what work and what hasn't. I did Third Rock from the Sun, which was one of the most mm -hmm. amazing ensemble casts ever. Oh, and John yeah. Lithgow is a god. <laughs> He's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, oh, and, um, great I, farce. I've done, I've done Carolyn in the City, and then I've done a whole bunch of other series that you may or may not even recognize the names of. And some modern, mm -hmm. I work, I've worked for Disney, I've worked for Fox, I've worked for CBS and ABC. I've worked for every studio How and exciting. on every lot. Small shows, big shows. It's been really interesting and has continued to add to my bag of tricks yeah. um, for Every now and then, what we've seen recently are some really cute, funny scenes with Tracy and her brothers that mm -hmm. have been almost like a sitcom. And mm -hmm. they, they, we talk fast, and we tease each other, and we make jokes, and we poke fun. And that really helped me lighten up, coming from a dramatic, very ah. um, emotional character over the years. It's really helped Tracy lighten up and be available for some light moments, too, which has been really fun. That is really cool. I mean, yeah. I, it sounds to me like you I know, right? <laughs> are totally going to be doing your own show, doing every aspect of it, or being a director where you know what the actor needs and wants, and you know what the people behind the glass need and want, and you can just bridge that gap. That would be yeah. fun. And I, and I actually do save time for them because sometimes they'll need something and without having to even tell me, I can see what they need and I can adjust the shot. I can move my body to be clear. Mm -hmm. I can pick up something and tilt it in the right direction because I know what the camera needs to see. I catch myself every now and then kind of directing myself to benefit and expedite and, and it actually works out really well. <laughs> oh, fun, 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 fun. Well, yeah. I, I do have a few more wine art questions if you have a little bit okay. more time. You know, when we had Jamie Lynn Bauer on the show, like Tracy, of course, Thori was a writer, and this is just occurring to me how fun it would be to see her back, maybe dating Jack, and you two going toe to toe. That would be interesting. <laughs> uh, that would. But she said she's considering writing her autobiography. Would really? Would you write your autobiography no, or memoir? No, 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 no. <laughs> I have the very same lovely best-selling uh, writer that I helped with one of her projects, specializes in people's memoirs, uh. and. Um, and having watched the varied and colorful list of people she's written books for, uh -huh. I can tell you that, in my opinion, there's not that much that's interesting about my life that people would want to buy a book about. Yeah. I love the idea of writing quilting books because they're instructional. It shares information with people yes. of a like mind that want to learn something I know. That mm -hmm. makes me comfortable. Talking okay. about my life, I just don't think I could fill a book. <laughs> I could tell them my grocery list and how many times I've been to Joanna's Fabric, <laughs> but I, I don't really feel, even though every single person has a story, and I don't want to discount that in any way. Yeah. I don't want to be flip. Um, I honestly think what other people might want to read and learn about someone else's life, I mm -hmm. feel like I don't have that to, you don't, to offer. You don't. I don't have enough 
to want to go to that much effort and hope that somebody finds it even, you know, would be interested. I, I just sort of feel like biographies are for people that have lived gigantic lives yeah. or for people who have a really important message that they've learned from their life that they need to tell. Well, I think you're humble too. And who knows, maybe in a few years. You, oh, you're you hilarious. Might. <laughs> I think the answer will be the same. <laughs> well, I ask you in part because, you know, recently two classic YNR stars have had their memoirs released the late great yeah. Jeannie Cooper yeah. who said wonderful things about you and then oh. the show's original Jill Brenda Dixon any memories of working with these ladies during YNR's very sort of high drama big shoulder pad days in the 80s yeah Yes, absolutely. Um, I have to say that I'll talk about Jean Cooper first because um, yeah. she's on everyone's mind the mm. last few months. And I've talked with Marie uh, recently about that. Yeah. Um, I've talked to a bunch of different sort of daytime magazines have asked me lots of questions about mm-hmm. my favorite moments, special memories. We did our The Young and the Rest of the Beautiful one-hour tribute. Oh, that, that was they brought so out. moving. Yeah. And then there were several follow-ups. That also kind of had to be brief because of the time frame obviously but also it had it had to be entertaining it had to be a show so my part of that was more introducing things and kind of expediting moving the show along so my stories fortunately I was thrilled they did on the website they did a bunch of other video clips of everybody's memories they even brought in other actors Quinn Redeker and Michael yeah. Damien and oh. Patty Weaver and really? several other people yes who after the fact got to come and have their memories recorded as well. And then those got put on the website uh, for everyone to be able to share more fully. A lot of people weren't available. And so that was terrific that they followed through. So it's been on our minds a lot. Yeah. Um, Jeannie and I probably didn't be, weren't in scenes together more than maybe 10, 12, 15 times Mm -hmm. in all of my terms. But she had this magical way of making, first of all, everyone feel like they were her favorite. <laughs> mm, uh-huh. And also, she took new actors under her wing. She loved to give advice and help you if you needed trouble with something or you needed to work through something. She yeah. was a great sounding board. And the door to her dressing room was always open. She always had people in there sitting talking and oh, bringing wow. things to her, questions. She was remarkable. And now she... Did, I thought, you know, when there were just a few of us, but as we all shared our stories, we found out that almost everybody felt the same way. <laughs> almost mm-hmm. everybody was her special, her favorite one. Yes. You know? But there were various phases in Jeannie's life that I got to because of three decades and joy. And there was a period that you're talking about with the shoulder pads. There was a period <laughs> where she did a lot of eye rolling and fingernail flicking. You know, she... she <laughs> Her hand and her giant yeah. ring were always next to her face in the shot. Yes. And her bright blue eyes were always, like, skybound. And she was always, you know, flicking her fingers. And I, the hilarious memory I have is in a scene, one of my rare scenes with her. <laughs> you know, Tracy, and she put, she flung her hand up next to her face and flung her, uh, uh, you know, fingers toward the sky. And one of her fingernails flew off and, and <laughs> flew across the set and, and like, king <laughs> something and it was hilarious because in those days daytime was a much more stylistic kind of acting now mm-hmm. it's got to be pretty realistic and natural in everybody's acting style yeah. but in the 80s heyday it was pretty arch you know yeah. and oh i will never forget that fingernail flying across the set everybody's kind of covering their eyes and not- <laughs> like watch um, out for that sharp <laughs> fingernail she was so larger than life Oh, I know it. And then in these later years, not too long ago, because she wanted to make me feel comfortable and welcome on the set because I hadn't been back for some time. Yeah. Um, she was not in the scene with me, but she this was maybe two or three years ago. She had scenes right before mine, and I was sitting on the sofa in the Abbott living room, and she could have seen me across the soundstage. And so when her scenes were finished, she stood up and she said, everybody, join me in welcoming Miss Beth Maitland, the <laughs> first actress to win an Emmy for The Young and the Restless. And everybody clapped. And it was really sweet, and it didn't occur to me until later that she was the actress who had waited all these years and had finally just yes. won her Emmy. Yes. And I thought, you know what? What a generous, amazing thing to do wow. with that statue newly arrived on her mantle mm-hmm. to be so generous to give that focus to somebody else who also, it was just a gesture to make me feel at home. How cool. It was cool. so generous. Yeah. 
uh, of course, I didn't want to tell that story. It, it seems sort of self-aggrandizing to tell that story no. earlier than now. But, yeah. but I'm um, glad you asked me because thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That yeah. you know, we all wonder in the hustle and bustle of doing a soap what those real moments are in between takes and in the dressing room. And Jamie Lynn Bauer had very few scenes with uh, Catherine Chancellor either, but she was very touched by Jeannie and talking about how she took her under her wing and you would think that she had played her daughter on the show and so to hear these things from you it just shows what a presence she was right down into her 80s yes and she was a big presence i mean she was abroad she cut like (laughs) the sailors she used to she hasn't in the later years but she used to smoke like a fiend and she drank and she was a broad my first agent used to play poker with her and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the stories they had of her early ingenue, uh, you know, starlet days in Hollywood, just cussing and drinking and smoking and playing poker all night. And I mean, it was a Hollywood story. Wow. And so she was bigger than life. And mm-hmm. everyone she touched, even fans have told me that she would, and she was terrific with fans and loved, and she considered most of them friends. And mm-hmm. she would stop to talk to you, and those blue eyes would drill right into you, and you honestly believed that for that moment, mm-hmm. you were the most important thing to her, and she oh. had that gift. She sure yeah. did. That is so lovely. You know, Jess Walton said part truck driver, and that uh, <laughs> that tribute, oh my God, that tribute opening with Jess walking in and playing off of that last scene that she had with Catherine in Good Night, which just oh grabbed everybody's How hearts. Eerie. Is that the most amazing thing, Chris? Every it, one of us has we devoted a lot of personal conversation to that. Yeah. How in the world could that not have been meant to be? I mean, it, Divine. it was... Divine. Yeah. Divine it, intervention. It was magical, yeah. <laughs> it's like Jeannie knew. Oh. It, it feels like something was at work cosmically that said, let's do this scene with Jill and Catherine. And she goes up the stairs. And it's like she knew that this may be it. And she that good night was just something that will live in everyone's hearts forever. And you know that that good night was not in the script. That was Jean. That, that's what Corbin said, her, her yes. son. Uh, just yes. she knew on some level. And um, wow, they, they couldn't yeah. have written something more perfect in a way, sad, yes. poignant. So I want to ask you about Jess in a bit because I know you guys are friends. Brenda Dixon, sort of the Alexis in a way of yeah. Y&R <laughs> in the 80s. Very, very, very good analogy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. She, I don't know if you're too aware. She's got a new book out. And, you know, she's had I a very am. controversial departure and dramatic. What are your memories? Because we see some of those YouTube scenes with you confronting her Jill which is quite different mm-hmm. from Jess's Jill. Jess's Jill is yeah. earthier and, and such. Um, but what are your memories of Brenda? Well, you know, it was a very formative time for me because I was just getting up on my feet. And mm-hmm. I was new and young and, again, not your typical other soap star, not the kind of actress that would normally take a soap role mm-hmm. and not the kind of character that would normally be there. And, mm-hmm. um, and Brenda was, in my opinion, always very complicated and always had... Uh, there's another one that was she was always bigger than life Mm. and Mm -hmm. honestly uh, we were never close although she was always very nice to me Mm -hmm. Uh, we were never close and we did not work many times together but she was married to my father in the story at the time right and it was after my brother and then played by terry lester and Mm -hmm. so we sat at a lot of abbott breakfast scenes together and stuff and i am really conflicted about what to say about her because again she was always nice to me Mm -hmm. but she there were antics (laughs) <laughs> she, she, she honestly um, was not easy on people, and yeah. she was not easy to work with, and she was not a giving, generous actress, and mm-hmm. she was a very, very ego-driven in terms of how she was treated there, and it made mm-hmm. it hard on everyone else. And in an odd way, I mean, I saw her at the Emmys just a few years ago, and it was nice to see her, and she was very pleasant. Mm -hmm. But she seems to be a person who has always had an agenda. And I honestly have not read her book, although I have read Jean's. I have not read Brenda's, and I'm sort of not going to. And this is pretty candid, and I 
hope that it doesn't hurt anyone's feelings, but I really feel like she waited until no one could defend themselves to mm. come out with several issues that were in her book and that I think are hurtful to others. And yes. um, just as a person, I feel like that cheap mm-hmm. and not, I'm not saying Brenda's cheap, but I feel like the, the gesture is cowardly. And mm. if she had those stories to tell and she had those things, access to grind, it seems like the appropriate, um, mature, and brave thing to do to talk about those things when others can either comment, defend themselves, or rectify it. Yes. And it seems to me a little too little too late. And mm-hmm. I'm so sad to see the wake of pain and hurt feelings that some of her stories in her book have caused. Mm-hmm. And I and to, to, again, see people who are not the direct stories in her book, it, it's just, you know, the family left over, the people left behind that don't have any answers, but that this brings a great deal of hurt to them and mm-hmm. sort of taints memories. I really feel like it's not very brave, and it was um, a kind of a cheap shot. So I uh, just choose to not put that on my radar. Well, I appreciate your candor there, and I'll be honest, I was a little nervous about asking because clearly she had a bad departure from the show. I've heard stories... <laughs> Jerry Douglas had something not nice to say about her years ago, and you never hear anything from Jerry Douglas like that. So you go, okay, well. And then I read yeah. portions of her book, and the things that she does say about Jeannie Cooper and Bill Bell, it just saddened me that, A, they're not here to right. talk about it. That, to me, is crucial in this. Yes. If you want to have these things to say, and if it's about getting publicity and getting attention, then do it when people can answer it. And right. you're going to generate twice the comments, but doing it now just hurts people. Well, you know, I appreciate your candor there. I read what Jeannie had to say about Brenda, and it was very nice. Not that she didn't say that they didn't have some issues from scene Mm -hmm. one, where (laughs) Catherine dropped the fur on the floor for Jill. But she was kind, and there was a Mm good-heartedness that came across from Jean. And my feeling is that Brenda's there's some people that are just hurt and they're hurt and Mm -hmm. they didn't resolve the hurt maybe the way they should have so it comes off as other things years later yeah that's really generous of you Chris that's a very (laughs) insightful generous thing to say well thank you you know you always hope people can get the healing and I personally just wish she had reached out to Jean 20 years ago and Bill Bell Mm -hmm. 10 years ago and said here's the deal or written the book then and then there could have been a dialogue and maybe there could be some resolution but uh, thank you for your candor there. It's refreshing yeah. and it, it's revealing. And um, well, I try to think. Of, you know, I I don't as an actor you to play a different character that's not you. You have to kind of think about how they think. You have to figure out how they. You know, character analysis is a big part of my daily life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and to see something that, like you said, is sort of striking out. Yeah. Um, regardless, you get to a point where, as we, we as young adults, you know, you get to a point where you can't blame your past on your parents or your, yeah. you know, you can't, you have to start taking responsibility for yourself at some point. Mm-hmm. You hope sooner than later. Mm-hmm. And in order to be a productive person, to be a good mother, a wife, a good uh, anybody, you know, a good other person on the planet, you kind of have to take responsibility for yourself. And i I just worry when people don't seem to be doing that. I feel bad, but again, like I said, I just have chosen to not put that on my radar. Because I'm so loyal to other people involved, I don't Mm -hmm. want those feelings to be even present in my awareness. In your energy field, too. (laughs) Right. I appreciate that. And then we have Jess Walton, who stepped into the role after Brenda's acrimonious exit around 87, 88. Uh, Mm -hmm. Your fans have seen on Facebook, Twitter, you've posted some photos recently of you and Jess feeding ostriches at Ostrich Land. (laughs) (laughs) And I live up in that area. And when I saw the ostriches, I'm like, wait, does Beth have those on her ranch? Because they have those in Solving. (laughs) Oh, that's so funny. Jess is recently moved to Oregon, and she and her husband bought a ranch. And they have just always dreamed of rescuing Mustangs. And they have recently rescued two, and you'll have to talk to her about this uh, for the details, but they rescued Mm -hmm. two beautiful Mustangs that they brought to their ranch because they had facilities and they had the ability to. She's never been a horse owner in her life. I've had horses since I was 25 years old. Uh. And I dreamed of them much longer than that. But that was the first time I actually could manage the money, the location, the time, all of it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I learned my horse in horse keeping over decades, and she had them for a year. And she went out, and <laughs> uh, by her own cleverness and uh, determination, she has found the premier natural horse keeping experts on the Internet, bought the books. She developed on her property with her husband a paddock paradise, they call it, which is the perfect natural horse keeping to mimic the wild. Wow. They built the whole thing on their ranch. They actually have, have a, even developed a side business building slow feeders because horses are meant to graze over time. This is all not, I'm trying to be quick about this part, but sure. here's where we get to the point. She has done all this completely on her own with no information or anyone to give her advice really. And wow. when we were, we hadn't seen each other for a little while when she was, and she said, I have to talk to you about horses. I said, fabulous. We shared <sighs> a dressing room on the day of the Jeannie Memorial taping. Uh. And she said, I want to talk to you about this. I see on Facebook that you know Jill Willis and Jamie Jackson, these pioneers of natural keeping. I said, yes, I'm longtime friends with them. They saved the life of a horse that we adopted and rescued. Mm-hmm. And they're old friends. And she said, are you kidding? there and they are sort of world famous she said i is there any way i could ever meet them <laughs> and i said yeah uh. come up anytime so she came up to my place and the two of us and my daughter um headed up to their place they have a beautiful sample paddock paradise on the mountains overlooking the ocean in lompoc and if you were from up here you kind of know the area yes um, and so we met for lunch and we had a, like a girl's road trip uh Thelma and louise road trip and she uh. um came here first and met my horses and then we got in the car and headed out had lunch with them we marched their mile track up the mountains hiked the mountains overlooking the ocean in Lompoc where the horses live um, and learned how they, you know, she was able to ask them questions all afternoon and they were so lovely. And then on the way home, we were driving through that direction through Solvang where you saw the pictures and she said, what is that? And I said, we have lived up in this area for a year and I don't know. So we're going to find out. (laughs) We turned into the parking lot at Ostrich Land and we were the only people there. (laughs) I love it. I love it. And, and for two complete animal lovers, we have, I mean, I've had a very colorful history of rescued animals and yeah. um, horses and donkeys, miniature Mediterranean burros, miniature horses, dogs, cats, chickens, oh. sheep. Uh, we've had goats. <laughs> so, oh. And Jess is sort of the, the same. She picks up strays. And so we just laughed so hard. And my daughter took all these fun pictures. So I it was our it. sort of Thelma and Louise road trip that was documented. We have <laughs> We have also posted photos at lunch where we look civilized and photos at the end of the day of her. We were, it's time for chores and we were feeding our horses and she met my big, beautiful Frisian gelding. His name is Drac, which means dragon. And this is, again, and they find me. All these fairy references find me. <laughs> so he, he came with that name. <laughs> and so wow. um, she met Drac and he just gazed into her eyes soulfully. He's such a, an amazing giant horse soul and, mm. and lived who, however many millions of lives and he's got mm-hmm. everything in him and he looked at her and she teared up and she said oh my gosh not even my mustangs make me cry this is the most amazing moment i'm having this magical moment wow <laughs> so she she now has a new boyfriend she's in love with my horse and um <laughs> it's all and about magic so, so yeah so we just had this great time to catch up and she stayed up here for a, a bit and then she went back to work refreshed and like, she has a bunch of new information to implement when she gets home to her ranch and she's going to make some changes and do some things that will continue to inform her really brave i mean you decided to retire and pick up rescuing yeah. horses that's just unbelievable she's amazing that is really neat so yeah after all these years you guys found something new to bond over <laughs> i know that they like to keep things really tight there in terms of story development but everyone knows that Catherine's funeral must be coming up is there anything you can tell us there has that been done or jill and tracy is there any story there that you can hint at i can tell you that it has been done and i can also tell you that jill and tracy did not have a story in it and i was very disappointed Darn it. um they did bring back a lot of historic characters to be a part of it mm-hmm. but it was pretty modest and really? it was my hope that they would take this opportunity because they had to wait to figure out how they were going to handle the loss of such a significant character to that story platform. Oh, I yeah. thought they would find something really amazing to do with having it impact so many different characters in General mm-hmm. City. Mm-hmm. And they have not picked up momentum. That has not really been very revealed. I'll be darned. So I did not get to go for the... I was not invited to the funeral. So, oh, uh, I'm yeah. shocked. I'm shocked. Yeah. Well, 
you know, my thinking was the same. My immediate thought when they had this time because of the advanced shooting schedule. I mean, this is the 40th anniversary of the show, too. So I thought, this is such a huge story to springboard with all of these legacy characters. Jill, Tracy, Jack, all of these people that have been so part and parcel of Catherine's life and Mm -hmm. Chancellor Industries and to bring back, I even thought, gosh, wouldn't that be cool if they brought back like Jamie Lynn and some of these characters Mm -hmm. from the first decade for a true 40th anniversary storyline. So, okay, YNR producers, if you're listening, it's not too late. (laughs) It's not too late. And that's what I want to also leave the door open for. It's likely that uh, these these farther reaching things have just not been revealed yet. Yes. Um, But I thought it was going to be just a a gobsmacking episode where uh, all of a sudden bomb was going to be dropped. Yeah. And I don't think that that happened. So we will look forward to watching and seeing what the fans think about it. And yes. seeing it will it will air shortly. Uh, I believe it's coming up. Okay. And so, yes, and I don't know how your broadcast time out. It is uh, within the next couple of weeks. I, think. I will do what I can to bring it to the attention of the producers in my little way. And many other fans will do it as well, that we want to see the ripple of this extend yes beyond a couple of episodes and i'm sure they have tricks up their hat but 40th anniversary you know boy oh boy Uh, that character in a sense was the young and the restless Catherine, and the 70s and 80s in particular in the first part of the 90s so much there to bring back via the death of Catherine. and quite frankly let's show some clips from those eras to continue to pay tribute to this amazing woman for months to come so that's my hope yes me too and you know i don't know maybe it's passe or out of style or something to show flashbacks but every fan i talk to the indications are that they would they love to see those historic scenes replayed. They yes. love to see flashbacks that aren't newly made, that are actual historic moments that they can relive and remember and, and have it inform things that are happening currently yes. and have it be a significant part of the current story. I know that that would also be not only fun for the memories and all of that, but would be so gratifying to honor those memories, and especially of her. Uh, so I don't know, maybe it's just out of style and that's not what they think the current audience wants to see but it's been my experience from everyone that's every fan that's talked to me about it that they would love to see flashbacks like that I agree wholeheartedly and I'm 41 I'm not 28 or 15 or whatever <laughs> that target audience is anymore who knows yeah but and I, who knows we don't I, know <laughs> yeah right right but I fall in the middle there and I gotta say I remember the show from the 70s and 80s and <laughs> they've got this tremendous library of shows and what a waste it would be not to incorporate those things over the next several months to draw on that fabric of the show Mm -mm -mm. So I hope that they uh, have a long-term projection for possibility there because, uh, wow, they should do it. I hope so, too. And something that might might help you in your understanding of them over there now is that it is no longer a Bell family show. Um, It is a corporate show. And so Um, mm. um, a lot of these decisions are made by CBS and Sony, who are the co-owners, the two controlling partners. I see. And seeing to it that stories are told. And so um, perhaps that's why I meant when I said... I wasn't meaning to be dodgy, but that's where I was kind of going with. Maybe it's not the style anymore that the network and the studio think the audience wants to see. Maybe there is some indication in demographics or the tools they use to determine these things. Yeah. Maybe they feel that it isn't modern storytelling. But Sony and CBS are the people who are making those choices, even more so than the writers and the producers anymore. And so uh-huh. although they work together as a good team to get those things done, it's a larger picture than we might guess. That's great context. I appreciate that. I didn't quite realize that, although I had heard about the, sort of the corporate structure. I always figured, oh, the Bell legacy, you know, they're still referring to the Bells on some of these things. So I'll just mm-hmm. have to tweet out CBS and Sony and see if they hear me. If I tweet really, really loudly. <laughs> I found that using all caps works. <laughs> <laughs> Screaming, right? He's either crazy or he really means it. Yeah. It was described to me as Twitter shouting. (laughs) 
<laughs> I love it. Well, a couple more questions for you. Okay, and then we, I hate to say we have to wind it up fairly soon. I've got to go to town to work tomorrow. Absolutely. Well, you've been so I generous. I'm the wrestler. Yippee! <laughs> Woohoo! Well, you've been so generous, and so I'll keep it to two questions. Okay, great. You know, you had mentioned Terry Lester, who originated mm-hmm. Jack. We've talked to Brenda Dixon. There were a couple of other Ashleys along the way. Eileen yeah. Davidson, of course, started the character and has resumed the role. As an actor, as Tracy, when you do scenes acting with and reacting to these characters who are suddenly embodied by a different person, what's that like for you? Because now they've got this other essence coming in. As an actor, how do you deal with that? I've always wondered. Well, there's two answers to the question. You can't deny that who is wearing the shoes facing you absolutely impacts the chemistry, the history, the warmth or coolness that's involved in the relationship you're building. I would Mm -hmm. say that most new actors to an established role want to do their best and want to make those relationships happen fairly quickly. And so I think that there's a lot of earnestness and a lot of desire to not necessarily play it the same way the other actor did. And they certainly all want to make their own mark on the role, but they want to have that all go smoothly. So there's an, an enormous amount of cooperation, especially at the beginning, when everybody's just kind of learning where they fit. Yes. But as the self-reliant actor, it's my job to be able to do my material to a wall if I have to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and so I mm-hmm. try very hard to flow with it, to roll with it if somebody's giving me something, but to not depend on it to give them what I am responsible for. Mm. And, um, for example, in, in making a film, if you have scenes with a big star in the movie, then it is very likely you will be there all day standing opposite them when they're saying their line. When mm-hmm. their close-ups are over and they swing the camera around, they don't shoot much multi-camera like they do in films. When they swing the camera around for your close-up, that star, unless they're just a really nice person and a very responsible ensemble player, mm-hmm. will probably head off to their trailer. Uh-huh. And the script supervisor will stand off camera where they used to be standing. And a script supervisor, or sit, you know, get a director's chair, will sit off camera reading from a script. Mm-hmm. So literally, you may not have even a pair of eyes to look into. Oh, really? Your part of the yeah. And it's not, it doesn't happen every day, but it's not uncommon. And, and mm-hmm. it's a, a standard you have to prepare yourself for. Especially mm-hmm. if you're not the co-star, if you're not the opposite lead, if you're just a secretary or just the announcer or just the doctor or just the doctor. I mean, it's very likely that you won't have the other actor to perform with if you're preparing yourself to act in a movie. Yes. So you have to be able to and willing to just do your same work and do it with as much whatever you brought to it to start with to some stranger or a casting director who's not acting back at you or a you know a script supervisor who's just head down you see in the top of her head and she's just reading the words mm-hmm. so you have to be responsible to yourself so in that way my second half of the answer is I have to be responsible for myself and always bring who I always am and okay. so that's always my job no matter who I'm working with no matter if it's Ashley number two or number three right, <laughs> right. right. but you can't you absolutely absolutely can't discount that if someone is bringing you something, you get more, obviously. You get a better relationship. You get a more well-rounded scene yes. if, if someone is giving back. There's no question about that. So the dichotomy is, yes, that usually the people, the new people are really trying hard. It may not be exactly what you saw before. It will never be the same character choices or performance. But there is inherently an earnestness to make it work. And I've never once met an actor who didn't want to spend the day being successful. Yes. Very interesting. Okay, well, that, you know, makes perfect sense. That's the way to do it. you got to be there for yourself and then see if whatever else is brought to the table, then that's just gravy, I guess. Yeah, exactly Uh, right. Cool. Well, my last question, you also appeared as a whole new character in the pilot (laughs) for this new web series, The Grove. (laughs) A very saucy (laughs) character. Uh, What was it like to play something so funny and different from Tracy? It was a blast. (laughs) <laughs> it's always very freeing to not I mean there are things about Tracy that have to be true uh-huh. there are things that Tracy historically has always been that you can't I can't ever get away from her past mm-hmm. and so Tracy will always be who she is she will always be that yes. I mean I can grow her up I can mature her I can give her confidence I can give her bunk I can give her humor yeah. but all of her past is always there 
looking over our shoulder and coming out of her eyes. Mm. So when you get a chance to play something entirely different, like the Gloria role <laughs> in The Grove, which which is not for the lighthearted and is not for <laughs> like, not for under seventeen audience. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Pure content and swearing. <laughs> no, no virgin but, um, ears. <laughs> but it couldn't have been more fun, and I actually was a little nervous about it because this was the pilot. I didn't know the style exactly if it was going to be played for comedy or if they wanted it to just be edgy and and have sort uh-huh. of a comedic element but still be really realistic soap. Mm-hmm. And there was a, I discussed this with Crystal Chappelle, not only the other star, but also uh, the executive producer. Um, I discussed it at length with Crystal and said, you know, I want you to really rein me in if I go too far with it, because I really don't want this to be too over the top or campy, because within the context of the bigger project, she's just a sort of a comic relief like, roll your eyes character. <laughs> well, I'm also always clung to this notion. Even if you're playing the most arch villain, the most evil killer that you could imagine, in order for the audience to watch and be able to be interested in what's going to come next, you have to find something in your portrayal that they like about you. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you. You have to find something redeemable that you can show within the context of what you're given. So for Gloria, she can't. we can't hate her. She's small-minded. <laughs> she's opinionated and bigoted. She's got issues but we can't hate her because mm-hmm. she's the mother of a you know another major character in the in the project she's the stepmother of played by christian leblanc which is so funny of a very misunderstood <sighs> character and at some point in the future she might be a key element to saving him from his badness interesting yeah so there's all these factors you have to kind of try to manage in your character analysis if she's too unlikable if she's too bigoted and too extreme and you're too shocked by it, then there's nothing to watch later. There's only rooting against her. Right. You have to root for her also. There has to be something in it where that scene with her husband, where we find out he actually threatens her life. He says, you'll do what I say. Uh You think she's all flip and devil may care. And she says, absolutely not. I won't. You can't have the wedding here. You can't do this. And he says, you will do that. And your life, or like your life depends on it. And he, and he means it. And you Uh can see where he got his power and that he's threatening her life and that she that her he keeps her under his thumb and keeps a mistress and keeps his life the way he wants it. She can't say very much because, you know, who knows what would happen to her. So, you I mean there there are elements that round her out that I wanted to make sure that it wasn't such a cartoon that people wouldn't go, Oh my god, that poor woman. Oh I can see why. Oh I get it. <laughs> She's still tethered to the ground somehow. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, quite a departure, another different side to you as an actor, and we see a lot of different facets to you now. Thanks for talking about so many of them here in your 30 great years at YNR. We are keeping our fingers crossed. Keep Beth Maitland. Put her on contract. (laughs) Keep her in Genoa City. And Mm -hmm. I thank you so much for your time and your candor and generosity, Beth. I appreciate it. Chris, thank you so much for the bright and interesting questions and for being willing to hear things maybe you didn't expect and rolling with it. It was a great pleasure doing your show and I thank really you. have enjoyed listening to your other podcast. I thank you so much and I'm up here in the Santa Inez Valley. I'll look for you at Ostrich Land. Right on. <laughs> Meet you there on Sunday. Bring okay. your dollar for the feed. There you go. Well, take care, Beth, and we'll be looking for a lot more from you on Twitter and everywhere else in the E-Universe. Thanks. That sounds great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Tracy Abbott Carlton. As we head out with this Blast the Past featuring Michael Damien and Beth Maitland from the 80s heydays of YNR, we thank Beth again for her terrific interview and remind you to check out her website at bethmaitland.com for info on her new ebook, print book, Twitter account, and all of her many facets. You gotta make a move. You gotta make a plan. You gotta make decisions. You won't understand You won't always be right You won't always be wrong You gotta keep your head up And you gotta be strong to you The new of the world You won't be true 
prayers to mourn the death of Catherine Chancellor on September 3rd and 4th on YNR. I can't get out of my mind the final scene of Jeannie Cooper ascending the stairwell, ad-libbing the line, good night. But after we say good night, before we go to sleep each evening and drift into another world of dreams, does our subconscious ever give us clues from people who have passed over, will pass over, or are currently passing over? Our resident Dreamweaver, the host of our reawakening segment, Yvonne Reba, says yes it does. Check out Yvonne's website at YvonneReba.com, Y-V-O-N-N-E-R-Y-B-A.com, and sit a spell while she explores dreams in which our elders ascend the stairway to heaven or otherwise cross over to the great beyond. Hi there again, Yvonne. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you, Chris. Wonderful. Well, here we are, already late August. Time for another dream or two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Terrific. Well, I have one that ties in, again, to our special guest. We're airing part two of Beth Maitland's interview, in which she talks about the late Jeannie Cooper, who played Catherine Chancellor on the show, the Grand yeah. Dame. What a great gal she was. Yeah. And her final scene on Young and the Restless was last May. Nobody really knew that Jeannie was ill or that she would pass away in the next several weeks. But I almost feel like Jeannie maybe knew. In the last scene, her character, Catherine Chancellor, was escorted by the gal who sort of plays her daughter figure on the show and was trying to help her to the stairs. And Catherine put her hand up. I've got it. I'm independent. I'm fine. Even though she had just had a surgery in the show, the character herself, and Catherine ascended the staircase for the last time. Halfway up, she turned around and she said to the Jill character, good night. And it turned out that was an ad-libbed line. I really think Jeannie knew deep down, her soul knew that that Mm -hmm. was maybe her swan song. And I was reminded of a dream I had about 11 years ago. My grandma passed in 1998. I was very close with my grandma. She was a big fan of soaps, by the way. Loved Young and the Restless. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Loved Another World. And this dream that I had was about four years after she passed, and it was very otherworldly. My great uncle at the time, who was like a grandpa to me, was very ill and in the hospital, uh, again, for several weeks with a, a condition, and we thought he was getting better. I have this dream where I'm almost like it felt like at the Grand Canyon. It was really sort of bizarre, a great big sort of gorge canyon area. And I'm walking along and I'm with an old man, but he's always sort of a step or two in front of me. And I see my grandma and it really felt like a visitation. It was like, oh my gosh, grandma. It was one of those really palpable dreams where you felt like maybe it was a visitation. So it was a positive dream in that regard. And after I chatted with my grandma, I continued to follow this man, walk with him, down to this sort of bridge across this chasm, this canyon. And it was sort of like the bridge in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, sort of thin, narrow. (laughs) Yeah, you don't want to cross that, right? Um, And there was a younger guy standing at the bridge, and we walk up, and the old man is allowed through. And then I'm like, I'm with the old guy. And the younger guy stopped me, and he said, no, you can't, you can't go. He may have said, you can't pass, but no, he put his arm down. And I woke up shortly thereafter, and I think I woke up right away because it was like, oh my gosh, my grandma. And that was sort of like the overwhelming feeling of I had had an encounter. And then, oh yeah, by the way, I had this old man in this dream. So strange. About an hour or two later, early in the morning, the phone rings. And it's my great uncle's daughter who told me that my great uncle had just passed away overnight. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh, that feels like it was him with me in this dream. And the fact that my grandma was there... And this whole bridge thing, so I've got to ask you, what does it all mean? Well, there are different types of dreams. And when we first started doing this, I think I did a quick sort of what kind of dreams we can have. There are message dreams where our subconscious is telling us to do something or warning us or helping us. And there are dreams where we're sorting out things that happened that day. Mm -hmm. I call those filing cabinet dreams. Mm -hmm. But they're they're very vivid, intense dreams. They're like visions, just like you said. Yeah. And they can be a total connection with another person. Mm 
a message, if you like, from the other person, telepathy, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. an impending death, sometimes a birth. It doesn't have to be a death all the time, but since death is such an intense thing, yes. that's what we pick up on. And I remember telling you several dreams of family members, you know, of my own, who had given me dreams when they were about to go. Yes. This is what you got. You had from your uncle, I am about to cross to the other side. Wow. And here we have the abyss, okay? With the this, abyss. The, yeah, this rather scary looking bridge uh -huh. which had a guide surprisingly enough this young fella mm -hmm. that died at the bridge and he told you that you couldn't cross that's right he was there to help your uncle across but you couldn't and your grandma was there of course to like help the, the whole thing and let you see that this was okay i mean he was going to go into a, a good place as it were to calm your fears about you yeah. know, anybody dying. A lot of people get very upset when a family member dies because they don't have a belief system or a faith in what's going to happen. Right. And it's obviously it's very scary to think that your loved one has been either blotted out or might be going somewhere not very nice, depending on what you were taught when you were a kid, you know, what kind of religion you were brought up in. Sure. But here you were given absolute confidence that he was going across the chasm to yes, another right. country, if you like, to another world, another dimension. Another and world. And that he yes. was going to be fine. Yes. Okay, and that you couldn't cross because it wasn't your time. It really was comforting, and I felt like the sensation of my grandma being so loving and so present and, like I said, palpable, that there was no doubt to me that that had to do with my great uncle passing and that he was going to a good place. Yes. It sort of freaked me out. Was this in real time, so to speak? Not that time is a concept beyond death that we really understand, but he apparently had passed right around the time I had this dream. Absolutely. And some people have reported seeing the person, actually waking up and seeing a figure standing by the bed or there, doing something in the house, they turn around, the figure's there, and then it disappears, or yeah. it says, I love you, or I'm going, or whatever. It, you know, it doesn't have to be a dream sometimes, it's an actual visitation. People laugh at this and say, oh, it's rubbish, there aren't any such things. Right. But there are, and people have seen them, and they're well documented, and, and I've experienced these things too, so mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. what this is about, and that's what you had, you were very close to him, and the fact that your grandma was there was to let you see that she loved him, she loved you, she was saying in effect he's coming with us that's we're, right we're, we're, he's coming over here we're coming for him uh, and it, like i said very comforting and my goodness the bridge the crossing you can't cross i think that yeah. it's pretty clear what it was about but the fact that it could have been and i and i believe you when you say really sort of a real time thing mm -hmm. uh, you know like a dream version of a of a visitation from a spirit that uh, hopefully those that hear this are encouraged if they haven't had a dream like that that there is a, another place and it's a good place so uh, and have you had any sort of cross over well, I've, I've had a like lot that. of them. Yes, I have. I've had a lot. Now, there's one that fits in with the theme that we have when yeah. you talked about Jeannie yes. and going up the staircase. And it's not my dream. It was my mother's dream. Uh -huh. And I was visiting England where my mother lived. And she said to me one day, she said, you know, I keep having these dreams where your father is calling. He's shouting for me. And my father had passed over many years before. And I, when she said this, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, whoa, what's this, you know? <laughs> she said, well, he's shouting, Stella, Stella. And I'm saying, what do you want in the dream, which is typical of my mother? <laughs> you know, she wouldn't have figured out what this was about. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm thinking, oh, that's a typical of a mom. So she said, well, I'm saying that anyway. She said, well, then I've had this dream. And this apparently had gone on for some time with him calling her over the past, you know, weeks or months or whatever. Anyway, she had this very vivid dream where she lived. It was a one-story small house. It was called a bungalow in England, right? Uh -huh. And in the dream, she had a stairway from her living room up. Okay, couldn't see where it went, just went up. And halfway down the stairs, my dad is calling to her in the dream. And he's shouting, Stella, and he's holding his hand out for her to come. And she is walking up the stairs to him, and I am down below in the living room doing something with boxes okay cardboard boxes 
packing Aye. them one, packing them whatever. Uh-huh. And she's shouting, Yvonne, come on, you come too, come on. Well, I don't pay any attention because I can't hear her apparently. And so she, that was the end of the dream. Mm. So she said, what do you think? And I said, well, Mom, it looks like Dad is telling you that when your time comes, he is going to be there. And he is going to help you over, all right? So we have the stairway. Yeah, we have the stairway. The symbol stairway. of crossing over, all right? He's going up to a higher dimension. Yes. Whatever you want to say. Yes. And I am in this. And I couldn't figure out what the heck I was doing. I just thought, well, I'm in the dream because she put me there. You know, I'm, I'm an important part in this whole thing. Right. And, uh, and that was what it was about. So... Anyway, so that was in about, oh, it was 1997, and she said to me on the phone later on when we'd come back home to Texas, she was talking to me, and she said, now you are coming across at Christmas, aren't you? And I said, yes, we're definitely going to try to come across. Across the pond. (laughs) Across the pond. And we talked a bit, and this was on a Saturday night in the middle of August, Mm -hmm. which is pretty much the anniversary we just passed it i was talking on the phone i said okay well mom call you next week and she said well i want to watch the lottery is just about to be announced you know britain has a national lottery and if i win she said i'll call you back i said well that's great i look forward to it and i love you and that was the end of it right well on the monday morning she had called the doctor and she told him she didn't feel well and doctors do come out to the house in some cases in England and he'd come out and couldn't get an answer which alarmed her next door neighbor because he knew she was in so after an hour or two and nothing had happened he got the police to come and they broke in and found my mother lying on the floor as if she was trying to get to the door but she had died of a massive heart attack oh wow right wow. and of course the police had found us up and told us that you know my mother had been found dead I mean it was just awful yeah and I had to rush back to England to organize a funeral and clearing the house and Doing all the things you have to do. Yeah. Right, so I'm in her house with one of my granddaughters who's helping me to pack boxes. And here we are packing the boxes, and I suddenly remembered this dream. And I thought, wow, I am in the living room packing boxes. Mm-hmm. And this imaginary stairway that came from this, you know, in the dream, it came from this room upwards with, you know, my mother leaving. Wow. You know, this life. And that's where she did leave this life, in the living room. Wow. And she was okay because Dad was there to take her across. It's and it was a real comfort to me. And a in a way, I felt my dad had given my mom the dream, but it was for me as well because she told me, and I knew that it was like, well, let's let you know that your mom's going to be okay. And I'll be darned. It's, it's all confirmation. Yes, it is. And if you've ever had a dream like that, don't dismiss it because those stairways, Mm -hmm. bridges, all of those Mm -hmm. things are pretty clear symbols for ascension, crossing over. So don't dismiss them and see them as sort of proof in as much as we can prove anything metaphysical. You know in your gut, it's proof. Well, there are a lot of things that, you know, we take for granted and, and we discover a lot. There's so many discoveries all the time through science of how the body works, you know, how the brain is working, how the mind works and so on and so on. Yeah. And we've got more and more evidence that we are totally connected. Yes. Um, that we can. Telepathy does exist. People say, oh, it doesn't. It does exist. My grandmother, by the way, had a dream of her brother and she was only a young woman, just married. She was in her probably 20s, and she woke up and she said to her granddad, so-and-so's dead. And he said, oh, and it was in the wartime, okay? And he said, oh, you're just, you know, worried about him. She said, no, I saw him die. And it was exactly as she had seen, and she was so upset, she got up and walked downstairs to the kitchen and actually wrote on the wallpaper the time and everything. She looked at the clock, put the time down, just to, you know, I've got to do something to prove that, that I've had this. Yes. And she'd seen him. He was a medic. He was rushing onto the battlefield, you know, with the, the stretches and things to get people, uh, the wounded, off. And it was in France, I think, and he was shot by a sniper who was up a tree, picking wow. off, you know, people who were coming on, which, you know, is a no-no, but that's what happened. And uh, that's how he died. And they didn't know for several weeks until eventually word came that, yes, he had died in this way. And it was exactly as she had described it to the family. So there was great evidence that she'd had this dream beforehand. She told everybody. She had the date and the time down. And then it actually was proved when the government sent word, and the war office sent word out with their telegrams and people come out and told you stuff. That was um, how it happened. So 
Yeah, it does exist. It happens. And so dreams can be bridges to the other side. Very good. There you go. It all ties together. It is all connected. (laughs) We all are connected. And I thank you so much. That's so cool that you had a dream with a stairwell. And, you know, I these little pop culture references that spark remembrances of my Mm -hmm. dreams. It's always cool to hear when you've had or someone else has had sort of a similar dream. So listen to your dreams, folks. Listen carefully. Well, Yvonne, I look forward to connecting again in September. Thank you. Well, I enjoyed it, Chris. It's always great to talk to you. Fantastic. We'll talk soon. Okay, love. Bye-bye. Imagine That with Chris Mann was brought to you by Retroality TV, copyright 2013 by Chris Mann. You can find us at retroality.tv and at reimaginethat.libsyn.com. Tweet us at Retroality TV or join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Retroality TV. And don't forget to check out our TV channel at youtube.com slash Retroality TV. We leave you with these final words of wisdom. Never be afraid to stand up for what you believe in, but keep in mind that it's the substance of your words that counts, not the volume. You can make more of an impact with Twitter whispering as opposed to Twitter shouting.